Great. So good evening uh, and good day to everybody joining us. I'm hoping that we have quite a few um, people based in uh, the UK, but we might have people from a little bit everywhere. Welcome to our US college panel. We have four fantastic universities tonight. Um, my name is Martine. I'm the, I work for UES Education, who you've probably heard of many times before. Um, and I also work as the college counselor at Charterhouse School and at at Weatherby Senior School in central London. So tonight, uh, yeah, we're very lucky and spoiled for choice in the wonderful institutions we have presenting. So without further ado, Oh, just before we get started, a little bit of uh, housekeeping. So it'll last about an hour. There's going to be about 20, 25 minutes of questions. If you have questions, please pop them in the Q&A and we'll get to those during our session. Um, so without further ado, let's begin with Mary at Notre Dame. Thank you so much. Welcome, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, welcome to the University of Notre Dame. We are a medium-sized Catholic research institution. We are located about two hours east of Chicago. We have students coming from all throughout the United States and more than 80 different countries. So it is an incredibly diverse, dynamic, and very exciting student body. And even though they are coming from completely different backgrounds and ideals and goals and aspirations, the thing that brings all of the Notre Dame students together is a belief in the central mission of our institution, which is to be a force for good in the world. And that is something that underlies everything that we do as a university. Um, it's something that is very much held in sacred trust by our faculty and our staff. And so it really is this unifying force among our community at the university that really starts to create that sense of home for our students. Um, in terms of a home, we recognize that our students are coming from great distances and that they're going to be with us for a number of years. And we really want students to feel part of the Notre Dame family, but also to have a more immediate part of that family. So our residential network is really a key component of life at Notre Dame. Students are randomly assigned to one of their dorms, and we're a little bit more old fashioned. Our dorms are single gender, so they're all male or all female. You have a brother or a sister dorm. Every dorm has a mascot. It's sort of like a house system, if you will. Um, they compete against one another in sports. They also have a form of government. And from the dorms, you feed into a really over-the-top dynamic campus environment with 400 clubs and organizations, publications. We also are Division I Athletics um, University, so very exciting level of play, especially for football, basketball, hockey, soccer, fencing, lacrosse, you name it. Um, outside of athletics, we're also very keenly passionate for the performing arts as a community, um, with more than half of our students having been involved in the arts. So if you are instrumental, vocal, if you are into the theater, um, if you want to be part of a large-scale opera, um, Notre Dame is certainly the place um, to consider. Um, and as well, our students are very much involved in service, um, with more than 80 percent of students being involved in community service at some point during their time at the university. This really feeds into our Catholic identity, which is a defining factor in terms of what makes Notre Dame distinctly different from the other top universities. Um, we feel that no matter what a student's faith background, the formative education that a student receives at Notre Dame is going to impart as much wisdom as it will expertise in their field, um, but being able to take things to that deeper level to really grow in skills such as ethical decision making, moral reasoning, um, you know, really taking gray situations and finding with your own morals and values that you develop as a student, um, figuring out as a leader how to navigate all of that. Um, so our students are really passionate for the life here at Notre Dame and faith life is something that's completely optional for students, even of the Catholic faith background, but it is something that is readily available and very much supported across the board here. In terms of academics, we um, have a very flexible system where you don't declare until the end of your first year. Um, in the first year, you can start to take classes in your major. You can dabble in our core curriculum. We also offer you the opportunity to do majors and minors. 
multiples um, across our different colleges at the university. Um, and our students are very keen to do that. Um, we also give you great access for research. We have an amazing center for those of you who are more focused on entrepreneurship or innovation. Um, and then we also really want students to take advantage of our study abroad. Um, we are one of the leading sending universities for studying abroad. And we have our own campuses in London, Dublin, Rome, and Jerusalem, but we also have programs and partnerships with leading universities all throughout the world. So more than 75% of students take advantage of these programs throughout their time at Notre Dame, um, with many opportunities for funding for different costs associated with those. We also have two domestic programs, one in Washington, D.C., and another in Silicon Valley, and those are very much a jumpstart um, for your professional career um, through the different ecospheres um, and what they have to offer you depending on what your major is. And then in terms of getting you ready for life after Notre Dame, you can easily get involved with our career development center, as well as our professional um, uh, professional development um, for those of you who are thinking about becoming a doctor, a lawyer, a dentist, so on and so forth. You can see here that we have a very successful placement rate as well as admission into professional schools. Um, and when you leave Notre Dame, we always say that you never really leave the university because the Notre Dame family is not just on campus, it is worldwide. We have more than 270 clubs globally that are very active and will serve as an amazing support and a continued branch of your Notre Dame experience um, once you have graduated from your years at our institution. Um, I'll leave you with this picture in terms of just quickly talking about um, some of the nuts and bolts of admissions. Uh, we have two different deadlines which are listed here. Um, for financial aid, we do meet 100% of demonstrated need, regardless if you are a U.S. citizen or a foreign national. Um, and so we encourage students to apply for aid if they feel that it is something that they will need to come to Notre Dame. Um, and we also automatically consider you for our merit scholarships, and those are awarded at the time of your admissions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague. Thank you so much, Mary, that's fascinating. Great, let's move on to our next institution. So we, uh, we're keeping up a very lively pace this evening, hoping to uh, leave lots of time at the end for questions. So um, if we could, um, I'd like to introduce Olivia Anderson from SCAD. Great, thank you so much. I will go ahead and share my screen and we will get started. All right, here we are. And let me just make sure that my sound will share. Perfect. So as mentioned, my name is Olivia Anderson. I'm the Associate Director of Admission uh, for SCAD, the Savannah College of Art and Design. I specifically work with European students. Um, so very, very familiar with your school systems. And uh, we may have even met on a couple of visits, hopefully. Um, so what exactly is SCAD? Well, we are the University for Creative Careers. So to introduce you into what we're all about, I'm going to play a brief introductory video. I'm driven to create to be expressive, to collaborate with only the best and across disciplines. The most exciting field to be in is design because a designer has to think about people, about technology, about the activities that are taking place. It gives you the license to explore and investigate and to try to create a system that enhances life. All you have to do is create. Sketch really great at giving me and giving all the students the ability to build things, make things. We have immersive reality, the latest AR VR equipment, and we're super proud to say that we're the first creative university to have an XR stage. This is a whole new paradigm for shooting, film, and visual effects. So SCAD's teaching philosophy is built on design thinking. With programs like the Business of Beauty and Fragrance, SCAD students go on to become entrepreneurs and pursue creative careers with top companies around the world. SCAD does an amazing job at making industry connections and making things available to students that might not be otherwise possible. Hey, Bees. Hey, SCAD. Hello, SCAD. I absolutely love SCAD. It's been amazing to have SCAD as a touchpad for resources, for inspiration, for people that just really believe in you and will do whatever they can to help you succeed. I am a designer. 
I'm an entrepreneur. Storyteller. Thanks to SCAD, my future as a creative professional is real. It's happening. You are the next incarnation of this beautiful planet that needs design, that needs beauty, that needs your mind and your spirit and your energy, your power, your unique voice. This is SCAD. to graduate as salutatorian here as the first member of my family to attend a college in the U.S. It's just an incredible honor. Because of SCAD, I am doing what I really truly love to do. It's been a blessing. So SCAD is known as the University for Creative Careers. So what exactly does that mean? Well, we have more programs of study and design than any other art and design university in the United States. All of these majors that you see here are available to students and oftentimes they will even do a major and a minor so you can combine interests and grow your skill set. This is over 100 degree programs across more than 40 majors and 75 minors to choose from. And Scott, consistently earns top honors from some of the world's leading creative institutions, including the Rookies, Red Dot Design Awards, Design Intelligence, The Hollywood Reporter, and The Business of Fashion. And we are constantly evolving our curriculum to ensure that our students graduate and become leaders in their field. We've worked with Google to create one of our newer programs called User Experience Design, and this is allowing our students to grow the skills that Google and specifically is looking for, along with many other tech institutions. And we are developing AR and VR technology to take your skill set to the next level. Now, this right here is something we're really proud of. For the past three years in a row, within 10 months of graduating, 99% of our graduates are either employed, seeking for the education, or both. Every single student at SCAD is given a career advisor. You have them from day one, and you have access to our career services for the rest of your life. So at any point, you can always come back to SCAD. We will help you network, brush up on those interview skills, or maybe update your resume. Now, SCAD has about 15,000 students across all different campuses, representing all 50 United States U.S. states and over 100 different countries. We have four different campuses to choose from. This includes our flagship location in Savannah, Georgia, where we have over 70 historically preserved buildings located throughout the city. We have a campus in Atlanta, which is the capital of Georgia. If you would like to be located in the heart of a downtown big city surrounded by Fortune 500 companies and different universities, this is a great place for you. We also have our study abroad location in Lacoste, France. This is a beautiful location where buildings are over a thousand years old. It's in southern France, really, really lovely. And then, of course, we have our online option where you can study a SCAD curriculum wherever and whenever. Now, when you are accepted into SCAD, you are accepted into all of these campus locations, so you can customize your experience as you see fit. And when you graduate from SCAD, you're gaining access to alumni of over 50,000 located across the world working for companies just like these. You truly do join a SCAD community. Um, it is incredible to hear just how many SCADVs end up working with one another as colleagues, as mentors, continuing on as friends. In terms of the application process, it is quite straightforward and quite supportive. The very, very first step is about a 10 minute background questionnaire asking questions about yourself. You submit that along with an application fee and you will be in our system as an applicant. You don't actually have to have all your documents ready at this time. You will be given a personal admission advisor and they're going to help you complete your application. So you can submit your transcript to them. You also have the opportunity to send letters of recommendation as well as a statement of purpose. And if you would like to apply for our achievement scholarship, that's where you can send in your portfolio and your resume. 
And of course, we always encourage students to come and visit. It's really a different experience to actually step onto campus, meet fellow students, meet with professors, get a feel for the university. And even if you can't come in person, there are many different virtual events, even something like this, which is a great place to be to learn more about different institutions. So if you take away just one thing from this presentation today, it's I hope that it's knowing that SCAD is dedicated to helping our students create something that they're passionate about and turning it into a career. So thank you so much. I'm going to go ahead and hand this over. Thanks so much, Olivia. So we've uh, so we started in in beautiful Indiana in the city of Notre Dame, and then we moved on to the East Coast and uh, a campus in the south of France. And now uh, very exciting, we're he uh, heading over to the West Coast uh, to the University of Southern California with Matthew Peterson. Thanks very much. Hi everyone, uh, let me just pull up my presentation and we'll get started. All right, good morning, or rather good evening to you all today. Uh, my name is Matthew Peterson. My pronouns are he, him, and his, and I'm one of the international admission officers at the University of Southern California. Very excited to join you all today and share a little bit more about our institution. Um, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna provide some background, some key context that we think is really crucial to understanding our institution, as well as dive into a little bit more about the undergraduate student experience. Uh, so the first thing to know about USC is that we were founded in 1880, about 140 years ago. And we're very proud and excited that we're still able to offer and extend the USC Trojan tradition to new incoming students every single year. Now, in 1880, we were founded as a Methodist college. Today, we are no longer um, affiliated with any one denomination. We are completely non-sectarian. And back in 1880, we only had 53 students and about 10 faculty members. And today, we've grown to be one of the largest private research universities in the United States. And I don't want these numbers to really intimidate or overwhelm you. I know that our total student population is inching towards 50,000. And yes, roughly 21,000 of those students are undergraduate students like students who might be pursuing their bachelor's degree at USC. With that being said, I think one of our, our student ambassadors or student tour guides said it best, you can make a big school feel small, but you can't make a small school feel big. And I think that's really indicative of the overall experience you'll find throughout your time on our campus, the different micro communities that you're involved with, as well as the larger community. And even though we have a larger student population, we're really proud of the fact that we're able to offer our students this nurturing environment that you might find at a smaller liberal arts college. And that's really tied into our average class size of 26 students and our student to faculty ratio of eight to one. By giving our students a smaller class size, it also gives them greater access to their professors both in and outside the classroom. All courses at USC are taught by faculty members. Um, all faculty members are required to hold office hours every single week. This is really an opportunity for our students to kind of meet with their professors and talk about the material in the class that week, really just kind of have a conversation. Our, our professors are really here to say yes, really eager to get to know their students that really want to see them succeed. With that being said, I'd love to kind of dive in a little bit more about the undergraduate student experience. So these are kind of the six key points, rather the six hallmarks that our office has kind of compiled that we think are really crucial to understanding the undergraduate student experience at USC. The first one being interdisciplinary studies, providing this flexible approach to the student's academic life on our campus. About 20 years ago, the former president of USC, Stephen Sample, envisioned for his students to become Renaissance scholars. What he meant by that is that he didn't just want his students to focus on one major area of study for all four years at USC, but he also wanted them to be able to delve into other academic fields, other topics throughout their time to really kind of give them this well-rounded academic experience. So you might be a computer science major, you might be a dance major or a film and TV production major. You're also going to have a chance to take classes across all of our 16 professional schools and one academy, including the Jordan Smith College of Letters, Arts and Sciences, the Viterbi School of Engineering, uh, the School of Semantic Arts, um, the School of Gerontology, the School of Pharmacology, even our own Keck School of Medicine at the Health Science Campus. And we do offer over 180 majors and over 180 minors, so there really is no shortage of academic opportunities for our students to pursue. Now, as a private research university, we're really proud of the fact that we're able to offer all of our students opportunities to get this hands-on learning experience to really overall enhance their overall academic learning on our campus. We've awarded over 700 US million dollars each year just for undergraduate research alone. It's not a graduation requirement, but you'll find a good percentage of students are pursuing at least one research project throughout their time on our campus. And that can be done in a number of ways, whether you want to do something independently, you can apply for funding through the provost office and use the funding to do um, as part of your research projects, both on or off campus, or if you want more collaborative setting, maybe in a classroom with your peers or working one-on-one -on -one with a faculty mentor, 
programs like CERF and SOAR through the joint type college. You don't have to be a student within that college to join. You can also apply for funding and use that money to work as a research assistant with one of your faculty mentors. But overall, we really believe this will give our students kind of a competitive edge, not just for graduate school, as well as their future career, in addition to kind of overall enhancing their academic experience in on campus, rather. Now, USC, we do have students coming from all 50 states in the US, as well as many of our US territories. We also have students coming from over 130 countries around the world. So we really believe that this student population is really not just representative of uh, the city of Los Angeles itself, but truly the United States and the wider world as well. With that being said, we are really proud that we're able to provide all of our students, both domestic American students, as well as international students, this opportunity to engage with each other, engage with students from all walks of life with different worldviews and different viewpoints. On the flip side of that, we do offer a number of study abroad opportunities for all students, regardless of your whatever your major is. We offer programs in over 50 cities around the world on five different continents. So whether you're a computer science major, a narrative studies major, you'll have the opportunity to study abroad at one of those locations located around the world. We also have nine USC offices located around the world in cities like London, Mumbai, India, Mexico City, Shanghai. So really, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what point of your life or stage of your career you're in, you're always going to find a supportive network of USC throughout the world. Now, thinking locally just a little bit, uh, we are located in the heart of Los Angeles. I'm a little bit biased about being the greatest city in the world, but I was born and raised here. Um, but there really is no better place than to spend the next four years of your life pursuing your undergraduate degree than in a city like Los Angeles. I don't want to speak too much to the cultural opportunities, which are pretty much endless in, in Los Angeles, whether that's hiking up to the Hollywood sign, um, exploring the different neighborhoods, checking out the rich food culture. There really is no shortage of opportunities in terms of those for our students to pursue. And we do have a Metro Rail public transit, the light rail that wraps around our campus with three different stops. So it really allows our students to get to downtown Los Angeles in a matter of 10, 15 minutes, or even go to the west side to Santa Monica Beach or to explore um, Century City in a matter of 30 to 45 minutes. Now, if Los Angeles or rather if California, the state of California was a national economy, we'd probably be ranked around 15th or 16th in the world. So those professional opportunities are really also kind of endless and truly in your own backyard as a student at USC. So everything from the financial sector to the entertainment industry, arts and humanities, um, even technology with Silicon Beach nearby, those opportunities are really accessible to our students. The Career Services Office, as well as with the individual schools, they will help you get set up on a path to success. And you'll find that roughly 77% of all of our students will pursue at least one internship, and about half of them will pursue at least two internships throughout their time at USC and within Los Angeles. Now, our campus life, I think one of the things that really drew me to USC as a professional in higher education is that there really is something always going on on our campus. It truly is this kind of 24-7 environment. It doesn't matter what time of the day it is, whether it's a weekday or a weekend, there's always something going on, whether it's a football game or some other type of cultural event happening on our campus. Now, even though we are located in a large city like Los Angeles, we are very much not a commuter school. We are very much a residential college. You'll find that probably 98% of our first-year students do live on campus in one of our residence halls. In fact, incoming first-year students are guaranteed two years of housing on campus to really kind of help them foster this idea of a sense of belonging at USC. Now, to get involved, it's very easy to do with over a thousand student organizations and clubs on our campus alone. It really gives students this opportunity to kind of engage with each other, really kind of see what they're, what, what's out there for them to pursue whether that's a professional organization, um, academic organization, um, special interest, hobby, political action, whatever students are particularly interested in, we likely have it for you to pursue at USC. Now, the last thing I wanna talk about, and it's kind of encapsulated with everything that I've mentioned before from providing this flexible approach for interdisciplinary studies all the way down to our vibrant campus life, and that is the Trojan family. What this essentially means is a supportive network of not just current USC students, both graduates, undergraduates, staff members like myself, um, our faculty, of course, and as always, our alumni network. We have over 400,000 living alumni throughout the world. It truly is lifelong and worldwide. Really, no matter where you are in the world, no matter what point of your life or stage of your career you're in, you're always going to find the support network of the Trojan family to help you kind of navigate the next steps forward. Um, I think that's about it in terms of undergraduate student experience. Um, just quickly about our timeline in terms of the application. We have not released our um, application deadlines quite yet. We are kind of reformatting our deadlines for this upcoming year, but we'll be sure to update all of you um, when that news comes out. But just so you have a general idea of what to expect, on August 1, this is when the Common Application opens. USC only uses and accepts the Common Application platform for the undergraduate student application. By April 1, all students who have applied by one of our deadlines, they will have received an admission decision. And May 1, of course, is the national can't reply to, to tell us whether or not admitted students are coming to USC for the next four years. Um, I'd be happy to share more about admissions later on in the presentation, 
Um, for your information, every high school around the world has a USC Mission Counselor assigned to them. So if you want to quickly take out your phone and scan this QR code, please feel free to do so and connect with us because we're more than happy to continue this conversation about USC as well as our undergraduate programs and the application process. Um, so thank you everyone. I'll pass on to Nicole. Thanks so much, Matthew. Very interesting. So now, um, last but not least, uh, we're going to move uh, to Wake Forest in the beautiful state of North Carolina with uh, Nicole McIntyre. Thanks very much. Hi, everyone. I've been to Charterhouse many times, and so it's so uh, nice to be able to connect today and hopefully um, in person maybe this fall. But uh, thank you so much for, for attending our session, and you've gotten to learn some about some great schools, and hopefully Wake Forest will also pique your curiosity about different offerings in the U.S. And so this is my beautiful campus. It's a beautiful day here in North Carolina. Um, if you're not sure where we're located, we are in um, at the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains in North Carolina. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about Winston. In Salem, just to give you an idea of where we are. But before we get to where we are um, geographically, we are a university of about 5,400 undergraduates. Total number of students is about 7,000. So that's one thing that makes Wake Forest kind of unique is that most of our students are undergraduates. So that beautiful campus that you saw before um, in the first picture is really dedicated space for undergraduates. You're not competing with PhD students or master's students for resources, facilities, or attention from professors. And that's one thing that makes Wake Forest kind of unique, I think, um, in, in the top 30 of all the institutions in the United States. Um, you can see our location here. Um, you might think that North Carolina might be more remote than a place like LA or New York, but it is just a quick flight from Charlotte to uh, London, for example. There's a direct flight. There's direct flights to Raleigh. There's also a smaller airport that's about 30 minutes away. So there's still um, it's still pretty easy to get to, even though you might not have considered North Carolina um, when you think about kind of larger cities in the United States. One thing that Wake Forest really prides itself on is the residential community. Uh, we are a university where you are guaranteed housing for four years, and you actually have to live on campus for three years. So most students that are attracted to Wake Forest really like that idea of a community, um, of living together, learning together, eating together, playing together. Um, that's something that Wake Forest students really enjoy about the Wake Forest experience. And so um, that kind of campus-based experience, uh, kind of similar to what you experience at Charterhouse, I would imagine, but something um, this that community building experience. I will point out Maya Angelou Hall. Maya Angelou is a world famous poet, uh, dancer, performer, um, and she was a professor at Wake Forest for a long time. So we have a lot, we pay homage to her um, at Wake Forest uh, through our newest residence hall, but that's our Maya Angelou dorm. If you haven't heard of Winston-Salem, I wouldn't blame you. It's not a huge city like London, but it certainly has a city feel to it. It's a charming city. It's about quarter of a million people, um, which sounds a little bit on the smaller side, but we still have great food, a really good coffee culture, actually, um, and uh, lots of live music. And we are known as a city of arts and innovation. So we have actually kind of a burgeoning tech, um, especially biotech scene here. Um, but it's a lovely community, and I think students who are attracted to Wake Forest really like the idea of kind of a smaller city instead of a larger city. But we have options here if you're obviously um, interested in a bigger, bigger environment as well. Um, one thing that's really unique about Wake Forest is that in the US, you kind of have these two styles of universities, large research universities and small liberal arts colleges. And I think Wake Forest kind of takes the best of both worlds. In some ways, Wake Forest is very much like a small liberal arts college. This is a typical classroom at Wake Forest. It's not rows and rows and rows of students with a professor kind of droning on at the middle of a classroom. This is what it looks like. It's discussion-based classes, professors that get to know your name, um, professors that invite you out for coffee afterwards, and you're only taught by professors. So that's something really important to consider. You're never taught by TAs or graduate assistants. Um, it's really professors who are expected to be really good teachers at Wake Forest as well. We actually call them teacher scholars, not just professors. We also have a liberal arts curriculum, which means that you're going to take lots of different classes. Um, and so if you're not sure what you want to study right away, that's actually great for Wake Forest because you're not allowed to declare your major until the end of your second year. So you have a lot of time to kind of do some soul searching, to take classes you love, to take some new classes, but you don't have to officially declare your course of study until your second year. And in that, you'll see the kind of divisions we have here. Those are classes you have to take. Um, so for example, you can't graduate 
graduate unless you take a theater, art, music, or dance class. Um, if that thought of like performing scares you, you can actually just take history of theater, art, music, or dance, but you're still going to be pushed outside your academic comfort zone. And we think that is a very good thing at Wake Forest. This is the full list of majors and minors. The most popular majors tend to be business, biology, communication, but also politics and chemistry and engineering. And so um, I always encourage students to look at what they're interested in, but also look at the full course offerings. And, and you should know that 89% of our students either double major or double minor, often in very unrelated fields. So you could study biophysics in German, and that course of study would work at a place like Wake Forest. We don't have separate colleges really, so there's a lot of flexibility and there's a lot of interdisciplinarity. And so hopefully you'll find a combination that suits your interests and um, helps you explore your, your academic passions. One of the newest spaces we have at Wake Forest is our Wake Downtown. That is where engineering and biomedical sciences are housed. Engineering is actually a little different. It's general engineering, so it's something to consider um, if you're not sure what kind of engineering you're interested in, but it's certainly a different kind of approach to engineering than the traditional um, course, the traditional kind of uh, streams that most universities offer. And I'll try and move a little quickly. We have uh, three homes abroad that students participate in. At Wake Forest, we don't ask each other if you're studying abroad, we ask each other where and when. Uh, it's a part of our culture. We're ranked fourth in the United States for percentage of students that study abroad. So it's something that students get really excited about. And it's certainly very interesting con to connect your interests with a place um, in the world. But we also have centers in Washington, D.C. and uh, in, in California, so to connect students to either the political centers or the tech centers of the United States. So there's so many opportunities to really enjoy that campus culture, but also get off campus and explore um, other places and how they can augment your studies. We are known for lots of student research. It's very well supported at Wake Forest. Um, we've had, you know, Rhodes Scholar about every other year, which is one of the highest academic honors you can achieve as, a, as an undergraduate student. Um, and so Wake, if you have that passion for research or you have an idea, you can come to Wake Forest and really start running with that idea and get a lot of support from faculty and the university, whether if you want to present your research or have the space on campus to do something with your research. And research isn't just in the sciences, it can also be in the arts, it can be in languages, it can be in music. And so we want to support our students, but 59% of students do some kind of faculty-led research at Wake Forest. And like the other institutions here, we have a rich campus culture. We're a division one school, amazing sports. Along with our sports, we put on um, a, a theater, art, or music performance once every three days. And so if you have that passion you want to explore, there's certainly spaces at Wake Forest for you. But you also don't have to be a theater major in order to be a part of a production. So that's something that that's nice that our size really allows students to have those different avenues for exploration. Our motto is pro humanitate, it means for humanity, so our students are not only engaged inside the classroom, but they're conscious of, of communities around them that need help, and, and, and they're, they're, we like to say that you're not just nourishing your mind at Wake Forest, but also your soul, so you're, you're constantly thinking about other people and how to, to serve your community um, here in Winston-Salem, in the United States, but also globally. We have service trips abroad, for example, but our motto really drives a lot of our Wake Forest experience. And I'll just lastly say, as part of the application process, we were the first test optional university to, or top 30 test optional university. We do not require the ACT or SAT. That certainly has changed a lot in the United States due to the pandemic of, of testing requirements. But we have been doing, um, we have adopted a test optional policy since 2008. So that's something that's really um, integral to our process. We don't try to boil any student down to a test score. We, we try to look at you as a whole human being and try to ask questions in our application to get to know you, but that's um, just part of our process and I'm happy to ans answer more questions if you have those about the test optional process. And lastly, just keep an eye on the deadlines. We do accept these three forms of applications and then we also have an early decision round. Um, and then if you're interested in scholarships, we do ask that you apply by November 15th just to, so that our scholarship committee can have a little extra time to review your application. And lastly, that is my email address. I am, um, I am responsible for international admissions at Wake Forest, and I would welcome your thoughts and questions about Wake Forest. Uh, please don't hesitate to be in touch. But hopefully I've given you a nice little overview of Wake Forest and, and, and introduced you to a different part of the United States that maybe you hadn't considered. But um, I'll pass it back to Martine. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. Um, so absolutely fascinating. I think everybody would agree. It's great to learn about um, about new universities. Um, I think uh, having met a lot of the students, I think uh, I know that uh, your universities uh, feature prominently on a lot of these lists. Um, so please, questions, do feel free to pop them into the Q&A. Um, I'm going to be uh, a little bit selfish to start off with, um, and I know that there are some kind of general questions that tend to come up when I meet with students, so I might start uh, off with a few of these, and then I can see that the Q&A is, uh, we do, we, we are getting questions, so we'll get to those uh, very shortly. Um, so I think maybe just to kind of get us started, I think one of the questions that comes up most frequently is that, you know, students start to get the hang of, you know, researching and finding out what they're looking for in universities. But one thing I would like to ask each one of you, if possible, is what are you looking for in students? So, uh, you know, in, in a UK curriculum, often, you know, they know exactly what they need for, um, for British uh, university entry, and then it becomes a little bit more nebulous when looking over to the US. So I'm wondering if maybe each one of you could very briefly kind of give us a bit of an idea um, of what you're looking for. And I'd like to start uh, with Mary at Notre Dame, please. Great. Well, I would definitely say that we are sort of looking for that all rounder. Um, we are looking for a student that has really taken advantage of their academic opportunities and has fully challenged themselves and dove into that intellectual curiosity that is part of who they are, um, but also somebody that really um, puts themselves forward in their communities, if that's in their school or in their larger community with their leadership or activities or sharing their talents. Um, it's definitely something that we want to see a happy balance between um, that intellectual prowess as well as that um, going forth and sharing what they've got um, as we want them to graduate from Notre Dame and do the very same when they leave. Great, thanks. Uh, Olivia, what about Stad? So we are looking for students who are really passionate about being creative, putting something out, putting something out there in the world, creating something. Uh, we have so many different opportunities that we present our students with, but it's ultimately up to them to take that opportunity and do something with it. So we're looking for that go getter attitude. Um, and that's really where something like the statement of purpose is a great opportunity to introduce yourself outside of the classroom, who you are, what you're looking to do, uh, what you see yourself doing in the next five, 10 years. Dream big because we are here to help you fulfill that dream um, and really be excited going into the next four years of your life. Thanks, Matthew, what's, uh, what does USC look for? Sure, I mean, you know, there's no cookie cutter student that we're necessarily looking for. I think we're lucky to bring in thousands of applications every year and those decisions are really hard to make, right? But I think ultimately we're looking for students who will really thrive at USC on our campus. So students who are going to be passionate about what they're doing both inside the outside of classroom, really wanna make an impact um, even beyond USC. So I think they're coming to USC to really hone in on that. Um, I think students who are really committed to their interest in getting involved on campus. Um, and I think the best way to kind of let us know about that is in our USC supplement and those short answer essays where we're asking not just about why you want to attend USC, but also about your academic interests. We wanna know why it makes sense to pursue human biology or film and TV production or whatever. Why does it make sense to do that at our institution? Because there are so many other great universities in the United States and around the world. And each one is very unique. So we wanna know why it makes sense to do that at our school. And we just ultimately wanna make sure it's the right fit for the students as well as vice versa for us. Great, thanks. And Nicole, Wake Forest, please. I mean, I think my colleagues answered this question beautifully, but I think it's so important to just note that we're not just looking for a certain test score or a certain um, A-level result. We're looking for students who are passionate beings who have multiple interests. I think specifically for Wake Forest, liberal arts is very important to our core and to who we are. And so students who are interested in that kind of curriculum and who are who show that to us in the application process. And as Matthew said, we have you know supplemental questions and ways to get to know you through this process. But um, I know that's one thing we talk a lot about at Wake Forest is, is liberal arts and how students will, will come and, and be a part of that scene on campus. 
Brilliant. Thanks so much. I'm, I'm very happy that everybody, uh, you know, talked about these kind of supplemental essays that, um, you know, often I think students think, oh, do these actually get read? And, and they really do. And so when, you know, we encourage students to really do their research about universities, it's really great, uh, you know, to, to hear how much um, value and impact they can have on a student application. Um, great. I'd like to, um, this is a question that tends to come up quite frequently, and I think I've seen a version of it in the Q&A. So um, is, is there any uh, kind of preference when it comes to, you know, the education system that uh, British students take, you know, at Charterhouse, for instance, we have both the IB and, and A levels. Does that kind of impact how maybe you would look at a student application as an IB kind of fate? Sometimes I know British students think IB is better because it's more like liberal arts we're touching on other subjects, but is the depth of A level also uh, a factor? Um, I don't know if anyone in particular wants to take this one. I'll just go ahead and say that you know we're all looking for students from a variety of different backgrounds, and so I would I don't think any of us show preference to any of any of those curricula. Both A levels and IB are incredibly demanding and will push you intellectually, and that's what we're looking for from a student. And so um, we have students every year who come to Wake Forest with uh, three or four A levels, and they do fabulously. And so it for us, it's just about that academic rigor and and challenging yourselves. And with both of those curricula, you cannot go wrong. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Um, another thing that I was wondering in terms of or, or you know, that uh, that we wonder um, is um, is about uh, grades, because, of course, you know, when students will be from a British curriculum will be uh, researching US universities, they'll come across GPA and then they wonder how do I convert my IB scores or my, my A-level scores? Um, so I'm kind of wondering if there's any uh, kind of way, um, maybe Matthew at USC, would you be willing to kind of touch on that aspect? Sure, yeah. So I think kind of the important thing to take away from this is that we are considering the student's application within the context of their school as well as their country for international students. Um, so those are kind of the two things that we're kind of considering um, when we sit down and review the application, obviously we're going to recalculate GPA, just kind of even the playing field for all students in our pool. Um, like many colleagues, like many institutions around the US, we kind of use a database of um, high school or rather grading scales that really comes into play within our um, recalculation of the GPA, just so that they're kind of aligned with um, US grade equivalencies. And so that's just kind of how we kind of take away from the GPA and just kind of more or less even the playing field. Um, and then we also take into consideration how many A-levels a student is pursuing, as well as um, their IB curriculum, um, any students who are pursuing advanced placement, um, as well as other curricula, depending on the country or depending on the school as well. Um, so it will kind of give us a, an overall GPA that will kind of let us know how well the student is doing, as well as kind of what the rigor is kind of looking like for that individual student. Yeah, um, at Notre Dame, we don't recalculate to form a GPA. We keep your grades within the context of the school in which they were awarded. Um, we um, have done the background research to understand the different complexities of the different A-level subjects um, or IB or whatever curriculum you may find yourself in. So we will accept it in the context from which it comes. Thank you so much, very enlightening. Um, so uh, an, another uh, question, um, moving on to, to maybe the application process, is that um, a question that tends to, to come up I, uh, is about um, whether a choice of major, for instance, you know, because in the UK students are applying to read subjects, does it have the same impact in the US? So, for example, if, um, you know, if a student is applying to engineering or if a student wants to apply to Spanish literature, um, you know, does that have a, an impact on maybe their chances of being admitted or how their application is, is looked at in the same way um, as in the UK? Do I have a, a volunteer? Yeah, Nicole, thanks. I'll be happy to answer that question. So I think that, um, you know, I think in the application process, it's always good to be yourself and authentic. And so it's never good to think about, you know, if, if this major is more popular, will I have chances to get in? You know, just be authentic and be yourself in the process. And I think that works really well. I will say U.S. universities value diversity, and we see that diversity in so many different ways. And part of, and one of those ways is intellectual diversity. And so we want students to have 
different interests um, intellectually and to be um, involved in, in many different ways on campus. And so, you know, I, I would never say to a student, put down a major that isn't popular at, to increase your chances of getting in because, you know, especially at a place like Wake Forest, students don't even officially declare their major until the end of their second year. So they have a lot of time to figure that out and it could change 10 times. And so for us, it's just kind of a, a marker of what a student's interested in. Um, we also like to see if that interest has been nurtured in high school a little bit, or if they've, you know, done a little, um, if they if they've thought about that um, in, a, in, a, in a critical way. And so, you know, I think that it does matter in the application process, but perhaps not as much as students imagine, especially at a place like Wake Forest where you don't declare your major. Now for other institutions, you might enter into certain colleges where there's kind of a different feel for it. So um, Wake Forest is not one of those places, but, uh, but it might depend on the institution. But I think it's really important to be, um, to represent yourself authentically in the process. Brilliant, thanks. That that is something we uh, we try to stress to stress is kind of finding that authentic voice. For example, through essays, you know, this is uh, I tell this to students, and uh, I know that uh, many of you in the audience have heard me say this about finding that authentic voice and that genuine uh, you know passion that you want to communicate to admissions officers. I think that's very important. Um, so another question. So let's tackle some of these in the Q and A. Um, so. We have a question here, which I think is, is quite interesting because um, several students will have more than one passport. Um, you know, if, um, if you're studying in the UK, if a UK-based student has a US passport or if their family is living in the US, is there any kind of advantage to applying either as a UK student or uh, as a domestic uh, student? Uh, maybe Olivia, would you like to... Sure. Uh, so if a student has dual citizenship with the US, um, they will want to apply with the US citizenship so they don't have to apply for a visa. Um, US citizens are also eligible for FAFSA, which is financial aid through the US government. So there is quite a bit of just benefit for themselves. In terms of how we look at students, we do not care what that citizenship is. And that's across the globe. US citizens, international. Um, as someone mentioned before, we, I think many, many US institutions really do value diversity. Um, so that's something that is, is very much welcomed. But in terms of logistics, if you have a US citizenship, I would always recommend that you apply with it. Great, thanks. Any other bits of advice or any tips from anyone else or do, are we all in? Are you in I would say um, when it comes to financial assistance, um, that is the citizenship is probably the only factor um, where any kind of difference will likely lie for the students who are with us today. Um, at Notre Dame, we read Need Blind for US citizens, but for foreign nationals, we have to read Need Aware. Um, but other than that, um, yeah, I would say, you know, <laughs> it's, there's no advantage. Great, thanks. Um, so we have a question here for uh, Mary or Nicole, or maybe both, um, asking about if a student is focused on a particular subject like English or history, how much guidance is offered from teachers to help choose, and I, I'm assuming here for, for a major. One thing I think American universities uh, do very well is advising. And so I think, you know, it's important to note that when you come to campus, you're never going to just be like, have fun, see you in four years on the graduation stage. You know, I think that American universities are really invested in student success. They're really invested in, in your four years of academic and social growth. And so um, at Wake Forest, particularly, you do get an advisor before you even step foot on campus. That advisor helps you with that liberal arts framework and the liberal arts course requirements. And then once you declare your major, you actually get a, a secondary major or a secondary advisor that helps with the major requirements. So you'll never be left alone to your own devices to kind of figure it out by yourself. Additionally, we also have a robust career center that meets with students um, starting day one that really it's not just about kind of a LinkedIn profile and a resume writing workshop. It's really about who you are and, and how you see your time at Wake Forest propelling you into your career and, and what that's how to kind of get the most satisfaction out of that. And so it's it's a very hands-on system in the US. And I think Notre Dame is 
is very similar to Wake Forest in that regard. But uh, Mary, do you have any kind of other um, things that Notre Dame does to help students with their their maturation? Um, no, I mean, it's pretty much a very similar setup. I will say in our dorm system, um, the leadership in our dorms, our rectors and assistant rectors are a bit more involved um, in that day to day. Um, so oftentimes they're working with students that are kind of like questioning, should I be at Notre Dame? Should I be a biology major? It's really not going well for me. Um, so that's the only additional piece that's part of our um, formative process. But other than that, it's very, very similar. And I think you'll find that with schools that blend research with the liberal arts. And there's such flexibility, right? I mean, so many students want to be a doctor until they take organic chemistry. And then that tends to help, stu or help students know whether or not that's the right path for them. And so I think American universities, one similarity we all have is that there tends to be a little bit more flexibility than other options around the world. Yes, never underestimate the ability to be able to change your mind. <laughs> Um, great. The next question, uh, actually, I would like to ask Matthew, please, um, to talk about uh, the test optional process, if, if you can, at USC. How does that play in to the admissions? Um, sure. Yeah. So test optional is relatively new for our institution. We decided to no longer require test scores, SAT or ACT scores in 2020 as a result of the pandemic and its impact on testing sites around the world. We just didn't feel that would be fair for all students or to still require that from all students, especially our international student um, population. So as of 2020, we went test optional and we are extending that policy for this upcoming academic, or excuse me, application cycle. So for students who are applying for fall of 2020-23, um, any students that are interested in applying beyond that, we will come to reevaluate this policy hopefully very soon and be sure to update you all on that front. Uh, when we say test optional at USC, we truly mean it's optional. Uh, we don't have a preference for students to submit test scores or not. We really want that to be a personal decision that a student have to make with themselves, their family, and any school officials, school counselors, or college counselors to really make this decision. Um, students who want to submit test scores, we will totally welcome it, and we will totally consider it as part of your application. Um, students who do not submit test scores just because they haven't been able to sit for an exam, um, they took an exam maybe a couple of years ago, weren't really happy with that score and haven't had a chance to resit for it. Um, don't feel like you have to submit a test score. If you really feel very confident about your overall application, how well you've done in high school, um, how well you might do on your A-levels or IB exams, then that's all you need to present to us. I think we've shown over the last couple of years, like many other institutions who've recently gone test optional, that we can still make a full-throated, fair and informed decision based on everything that's in front of us. Um, you know, test score is just one piece of the overall picture that we're looking at in terms of the application. Um, and I do want to stress for USC in particular is that students who do not submit test scores will not be penalized or disadvantaged, and they will still be fully considered for admission as well as merit scholarships. Brilliant. Thank you so much uh, for that. Um, now, uh, Olivia, actually, I would like to, to ask you, um, so you mentioned uh, SCAD's kind of uh, very strong career services and how you kind of have access to them uh, through a lifetime. And I find that this is something that US universities do brilliantly, which is uh, the, the alumni associations and these kind of career services. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about, uh, you know, their strength and importance. Absolutely. So uh, we always encourage students when they first join SCAD to go ahead and create that relationship, connect with their career advisor early on. It may seem like you're going to graduate in four years, that's so long, but it goes so quickly. And it's really great to be aware of what resources are available while you're a student. So including uh, career fairs, we do offer one um, each quarter. So that's going to be three times a year. Two of them are traditional style where the companies are coming and presenting themselves to the students and one is actually an inverse style so the students have the opportunity to create their booths for the companies to walk through which is quite fun um, so that's kind of some of the resources that are available on campus um, and then once you graduate you do have a really great alumni network and it's a fantastic opportunity to kind of stay connected with all of those SCAD alumni um, let's see if there's a connection at a company that you would like to work for, or maybe you want to ask someone about their experience working in a particular sector. And that's really where going back and using those career services is always, always a good option. Um, and that doesn't really matter at what stage you're in, whether it's early career or maybe you want to have a career shift down the road. Each of us have gone through that. And so our advisors are kind of aware of that and equipped with the right skills to help you in that process. 
Great, thanks so much. Um, so we do have a, a question here in the, the Q&A and I do want to touch on it, but I want to kind of make it a little bit broader if everyone will allow me to do this. Um, and I'd, I'd like to maybe direct it at Mary, please. Um, so talking about sports and I know, I mean, sports are so important at US colleges. Um, and I know that, you know, some colleges will offer, you know, kind of recruit students or offer scholarships, but um, so maybe we could touch a bit on that, but also how can students, you know, really highlight, you know, what importance does it play in the admissions process? Or, you know, does it depend on the student? What can a student do to highlight maybe some of these uh, aspects? I know it's a broad question, sorry. I did, I'm throwing the ball, Mary. <laughs> yes, well, I will be right up front and say with the NCAA requirements, um, where our offices are quite separate from the recruitment process. So in terms of standing out to us, what will stand out to us is that you've done well with your classes and that, um, you know, yes, you have obviously a very clear talent, but maybe also other things that you have contributed yourselves to, or um, you took time to really write a, a thorough and, and very helpful essay. Um, but we do work with the coaching staff just to assess you academically and make sure that you meet eligibility standards. Um, and I will say that, you know, there recruitment process is something where a student kind of starts early in the game, um, building up their their profile and being in touch with the coaches. Um, and I would really recommend to students who are hoping for the recruitment process to work for them um, to make the NCAA website their first stop so that they can make sure that they are in compliance and they have submitted their information so that the coaches will be willing to talk with them um, because they have seen that they have submitted their information and um, are eligible for that engagement process. Um, and I will also say to too, that even if you are not recruited and given a scholarship to play your particular sport, there are many universities that are going to meet full need. Um, and then you could always attempt to walk on or you could play at the club level. And at most top universities, club level is a very healthy level of play, maybe not the biggest time commitment as NCAA Division I, um, but it would still allow you an opportunity to represent your school against other top universities um, in a competitive format. So I would say that that's kind of what I have to offer on that point. And then and Nikki and um, Matthew, if you want to chime in, um, please, both of you are also division one. I think Mary hit the nail on the head. It's definitely a separate process. So don't be afraid to advocate for yourself. Don't be afraid to pick up the phone and call the coaching staff or the athletics department. They'll be able to guide you and they work with us. And so it's best if the student kind of um, advocates for themselves because we can't go to the athletic office and say, I have an amazing soccer player, right? That's not how that works. <laughs> yeah, very similarly to uh, Mary and Nicole. Um, our office is very separate. Um, advocate for yourself in this process. It's a very unique process for student athletes. Um, USC offers contact a coach. So if you Google contact a coach USC, you can potentially get connected with one of our um, athletic departments or athletic teams on campus and just have a conversation about potentially joining or learning more about the recruitment process. Fantastic. And I believe that that takes us to the end of our time with everyone. So I would like to very sincerely thank uh, our fantastic panelists uh, for giving up their time today to come and speak with us and answer all of our questions about US applications. Um, I'm going to post my email address. So I've got two. Um, so if you want to contact me via UES Education, you can on the first. Um, if you want to contact me via Charterhouse, you can on the second. Um, perhaps our panelists would be willing to pass on their details as well. Um, also, I'll leave the chat open just for a little bit. And again, anything at all, please do get in touch with us. Um, at UES Education, we host uh, quite a few webinars um, for, for students all around the UK. We're a big fan of sharing information and hoping to make this process a little bit more transparent and uh, a little bit less stressful. Um, so please get in touch. And once again, thank you very much uh, to Nicole, to Olivia, to Matthew and to Mary. And I, uh, I hope to see you guys again soon. Good night, everybody.